Good afternoon and welcome to Vermont. We are continuing our discussion on page 546, actually relating to racial justice statistics. And we are going to start with Kristen McClure, Chief Data Officer, Agency of Digital Services. So good afternoon and if you could please introduce yourself for the record and welcome. Oh, I'm sorry, actually, sorry, I made a mistake. Sorry, Martin. <laughs> That's all right. But yeah, I mean, uh, before we get started, uh, uh, Ms. McClure, I just want to kind of uh, set some framing a little bit to let everybody know kind of where we are with this and, and uh, be focused for, for today. Uh, so last time uh, that you uh, testified, uh, you did uh, give us some initial information as far as uh, the resources that might be needed uh, for standing up this division and, and doing the work uh, as set forth in this bill. Uh, but since then, I, I have had some conversations with uh, folks in Appropriations Committee uh, and, and others, and, and we need to dig into that a little bit more to have a little bit more understanding of, of what the resources are needed, uh, both initially and perhaps longer term. And you know, some of the questions that have come up is, you know, it may take some number of months to hire the right people. It, you know, there are certain, there's certain foundational work that presumably needs to be done before we get into serious uh, data analysis and questions uh, as far as understanding the availability of data, the reliability of data, the systems that are available to provide uh, the data in, you know, for this, et cetera. So we kind of want to understand how you would see this rolling out. <clears throat> and we want to try to understand a little bit better of what the resources are, are of the Agency of Digital Services, what exactly, well, maybe not exactly, but a, a little more detailed level as far as what would they be doing uh, given the cost that, that we would incur uh, for that from, from ABS. And what we would anticipate uh, the division itself would be doing <coughs> and when. So we're trying to dig into the details a little bit more to justify whatever those resources are that are necessary, particularly for this first year, and what we would anticipate over a longer term, if that, if that all makes some sense. Now, I know when we get to, uh, to Director Davis, I know there are some other questions that are out there that I'd like to explore a little bit with folks today, such as the makeup of the advisory panel. I don't really think that's so much uh, Mr. Poor's uh, area as much as uh, uh, Director Davis, uh, but we'll wait for her to, to get into some of those other issues as well. Uh, and I, I guess I'd ask uh, Representative Squirrel if there's anything additional that you want to throw out there up front as far as what we're looking to understand today? Uh, no, uh, Representative Lamont, I think you framed it very well. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you, Martin. Appreciate it. Welcome. <laughs> thank you. Very good. Thank you. Uh, for the record, Krista McClure, Chief Data Officer with ADS. Uh, thanks for having me today. So I'll go through and talk about the ADS resources, like staffing resources, and the timing of when I would anticipate needing them. Um, so, and, and we're talking identified data, so I'll focus in that space. So one is a database administrator, and the role of the DBA database administrator is really to take the data, put it into a database, manage the database, really do that, that technical detail, the backups, make sure it has the appropriate security. They would also write the code to do the matching of the person from one data set to another to make sure the linkage is there. They would create the unified data set and then provide access to the division. So that role, that role you can like, phase in a little later, probably about, I would say, a month before the data is actually going to be sent to the division. It's not one of the earlier roles that you need. So you would need about, probably about a month to set up the database, get the tables ready, get the schema ready, 
but it's not one of the early phased roles. Any questions on that before I go to the project manager role? Yeah, I just just one other. Uh, I just want to throw out one other item if you could address as, as far as some of the issues that I raised, but also um, the data sharing agreements and how that fits into this process and who would be managing that as well. But uh, I didn't have any questions about the administrator. Thank you. Okay. Yep. And I'll make sure we touch on the DUAs and I would sprinkle that in as part of the division work. Just take a note. Um, for the other ADS role, there is one other ADS role that we had recommended and that's a project management role. I would see this role as needing to start quite early on with the division roles to really plan the work, um, scope out the work, determine the deliverables, um, assess any risks and keep the project create a project plan and keep it on track. So I would see that quite early on in the process. That covers, those are really only the two ADS staffing roles. Um, both we have scoped out as contractor at the contractor rate. Um, so it's worth noting that as part of the cost structure. Um, Representative Lalonde, do you want me to go into the division staffing or would you like to stick with ADS cost? Uh, let's stick with ADS cost first, if we okay. could, and then transition to the division. I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, so there are two other components to the ADS cost. One is specifically the technology component, which I'll go through. And the other is what I'll refer to as like the division costs of ADS, which kind of every division incurs, and there are two components to that. So the first one on the technology cost um, I'll just step through the different components of it. We have the data transfer, which is each business area sending the data to the division. So that's essentially uh, a no cost feature, very, very low minimal cost. Um, so I assess it at about $0. There's a hosting cost that'll be needed. So to really house the data and the database, the cost structure around that, about $5,000. And again, it's based on assumptions around the size of the data. So as we better hone in on how many different data sets and the size of the data, and if the committee would like historical data included, because I did not assess any cost of historical data since it wasn't noted in the bill. But if we do have a very broad, big set of data that we want included, um, we can better refine that. The other cost, which I talked about last time was the one-time CGIS setup cost, and that's a criminal justice information system cost. That's required for working with CGIS data, so we would need the environment where the data lives to be CGIS compliant. So it's really a configuration cost, again, a one-time cost, and to create that safe CGIS environment for the data. There are a few other items listed in the bill around technology cost, one is Having a public website, again, that's essentially um, no cost, so assessed at zero dollars. Having a dashboard, and this is, it's roughly $96 per person per year. So if we're assuming five headcount for the division, it's about $500. And then the last item in the technology cost is around publishing the raw data file um, online, which we call to open data that's essentially uh, zero cost as well. So from a technology cost perspective for the identified data, it's about $45,000, 500. The last component to the ADS cost are basically costs that each agency division occur, incurs. And that's consisted of allocation and SLA, which is service level agreement. So allocation costs are costs that are statewide costs. So really every agency division department in the state benefits from. So it's allocated evenly based on headcount. So for the assumptions here, we modeled it after another division that has five headcount. And that would be about $30,000 for allocation costs, which is like cybersecurity, um, 
open data would fall into that security around how we log into the computers to make sure it's a safe network. The SLA component, the service level agreement component. Again, we modeled this after a division with five headcount. It has, includes in it licensing costs. So Microsoft Office license cost and any additional hosting cost. So that's about $20,000 we ballparked for that. Any questions on the technology costs before I talk about division staffing? So, so uh, yeah, I did have one question. Um, so you said the 30,000 is based on five, 20,000 is based on five. So would it pretty much be 4,000 per person for the service level and 6,000 per person for the agency division? I mean, if, so if there's fewer people, we just take, we reduce that amount. For the most part, yes, exactly. The Where the allocation fluctuates is if there are more state employees one year than a previous year, it would be less, you know, the peanut butter spread would be less. If there are fewer, it'd be a little more. But for the example we have here, yes, that's exactly how it would work. Thank you. Uh, Representative Skrill. Uh, yeah, Kristen, just a quick clarification. Uh, the cost mm -hmm. that you just work your way through uh, for the most part, I think there was only one that was probably a one-time cost. These are annual costs, correct? Correct. Okay, thank you. Uh, did you say how much this, these- uh, Oh, the CGIS? The CGIS um, cost $40,000. Oh, somehow I missed that. Okay, and, and that would be a one-time cost. One-time, correct. And yes, the costs I stated were annual costs as well. And that's the one, the only one-time cost. And, and how long would, uh, would you expect that the project manager would be on board? I would estimate about a year and a half, potentially two years. And presumably the database administrator, once they start, they're an ongoing cost. They're an ongoing cost. I would expect, and we can kind of talk about the out years more. I would expect after the first two years, there to be a rhythm and a pattern to the, the data that's being sent and it being a little more standard and repetitive, at which point I would expect a lower level of support needed from the database administrator. If the data continues to be Every year, it's like a brand new set of data and data elements and data schema and very messy. It could be the same amount of headcount throughout. I would, I would not anticipate that scenario, though. I would anticipate the division getting in a groove with the business, um, consistent data sets and schemas being sent, so needing less support from the DBA over time. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I don't see any other hands right now. Okay. So I'll step through the kind of the division headcount, but I'll also, Suzanne, I'll also defer to you and please feel free to jump in. Um, I'll start with kind of the, the data roles of the division. And I should mention, because it was brought up last time for testimony, I think Coach had brought it up. Um, so the roles that I'm gonna talk about are also included and they were comprehended as part of RDAP. Some of the terminology we use is different for the responsibilities, but um, really similar overlap in terms of the primary duties, responsibilities, with the exception of the database administrator that wasn't as specifically called out in RDAP for the staffing. So for, there are two specific data roles that um, I had recommended for the division, one was a data analyst and the other was a data steward. So a data analyst, primary responsibility, analyzing the data, really doing that deep, uh, deep analysis around the data. I would expect the data analyst to create and maintain the dashboard that's outlined in the bill. Um, I would 
expect the data analyst to be able to perform all the roles and functions that the state data steward would do. So the data analyst has somewhat of a broader skill set than a data steward. Um, and I would expect the data analyst to also be part of the discussions around data governance with that lead. So working with the business to establish the data governance and the data definitions and standards. The next role is the data steward. And the data steward typically focuses on cleaning the data, high quality of data, KPIs around the data, and being the role that executes the vision of data governance. So making sure the data governance is being implemented. And then Susanna, I don't wanna speak for you, but I'll talk through the lead role, if that's okay. And then you can correct me. Mm. So certainly for the lead role to lead and coordinate the team and the direction, I would expect the lead to have the vision for um, how they wanna roll out the data governance, how they want the business, which data elements that they want to receive from the business, how to standardize the data collection of the different elements, uh, to, do the, to do the DUAs, the data usage agreements with the different owning areas, um, to do any contract management, grant application. I think those are the key responsibilities I would see from the lead. So as, as far as, as uh, timing on, on when these folks should be coming on board. Um, so, so there's, <clears throat> we have down five uh, in the bill, but I've really been quite questioning whether we're gonna have the work for them to do initially since isn't the first step, really some of these foundational <clears throat> issues of getting, actually getting the agreements in place uh, figuring out the data, or, or am I wrong? It just it just seems that we would ramp up to that level, but does one need that initially to to get this started? I could see where we could ramp up, and when I say ramp up, like a pretty fast ramp up, um, where we would want to start with the lead, at least a data analyst and a data steward to create the data usage agreements, start having those discussions with the business. And then maybe once there's some traction in place to bring on the next data analyst and data steward. But I would really see that, that core team of the data analyst steward lead really working at the beginning and doing all that foundational work together. Okay. So, um... I'll, I'll defer to Chris. Yeah, go, go ahead, Trevor. Yeah, I guess uh, to sort of follow up to what you're discussing, Kristen, what do you see as a timeline? Let's say we approve this bill, get signed, we get started in July. How quickly can this all ramp up? How quickly could it all ramp up to the point where we would have, I just want to make sure I'm understanding the scope well, of that. For instance, when I look at the bill, there's a report through the very beginning mm -hmm. of 23. Yep. So there's expectation there, but things would be operating fully. But that's the way I read that. Okay. Is that is that is that too optimistic or is that in your estimation realistic? I think that's a very aggressive timeline to be at that end state. I think it's realistic to have a report of maybe it's four or five data sets that are complete that you've worked with the business on. To anticipate full completeness in six months, I think is very aggressive. Yeah, okay, thank you. All right. So, so just following up with that, um, would the work progress perhaps that uh, when you said, you just mentioned the number of data sets uh, would the division perhaps look at 
say, law enforcement as perhaps through the Bell Corps system providing a data set, and then the state's attorney with whatever their new system is, that's a, I understand that they're moving to, and then the courts, I mean, that those are considered each data sets essentially, is that my understanding? Correct. Like, exactly, so for, um, for instance, the DPS side of it, I would consider traffic stops one data set, use of force, a different data set. Um, the court system, I'm less familiar with that space, but kind of any unique distinct data that they're collecting around um, bail or acquittals or convictions, maybe the same data set potentially. And, and in your experience, are, are there gonna be some data sets that might be a little more straightforward to, to deal with than others? Yeah, I, I certainly would expect there to be some mature, more mature data sets that have existing data dictionaries, standard definitions around their data elements. Um, the one that comes to mind is DOC. They have a very complete, comprehensive data set. It's a little more mature than some other systems. So I certainly would expect them all to be at somewhat different levels. Some areas and um, <coughs> Maybe this has changed since I last uh, investigated it, but on the judicial side in the court system, I would say it's probably a less mature data set. They weren't collecting race and ethnicity data at the time. That may have changed over the last year and a half. But for instance, that I would say is probably a less mature data set. So, so going, going into this, uh, if there are three individuals that we start with, uh, they're not necessarily going to try to gather everything from everyone right out the bat. They may, there may be some discussions of what the highest priorities are or what might be the most straightforward one to bring in. This may be as much of a question for uh, <coughs> Davis as for you, but uh, so, so there's work that could be done with three people pretty close to right off the bat, presumably, uh, although there's going to be some tougher nuts to crack on, on some of those data sets, presumably. Um, all right, I think that that's the question I had. So I guess the one other thing, I, you know, I, I, I've, uh, we'll probably hear, we may hear a little bit from Karen uh, Gannett as well. Uh, and, and, and we're familiar with, uh, somewhat familiar with the work of uh, the Crime Research Group. Well, we're familiar with a lot of the work. They do a lot of work for us here. Uh, and, and we talked and she was mentioning uh, various foundational type work, uh, and, and perhaps you can speak a little bit more to it, but really looking at each of the data sets as we're talking about it and understanding how reliable or credible they are or uh, what kind of systems. There's some what, what she termed foundational work. And this is, would this be more of ADS or would it be both ADS, the resources you talked about, and the division, or would that responsibility be more than division? Yeah, I see that more as the division. It's a lot of that process work of creating standards, um, which elements to collect, are they being collected in a consistent way across the different business areas, really understanding the data collection. That foundational work I would see coming from the division. Appreciate it. I think that's the questions I have. Are, are you good, uh, Representative Squirrel, on, on those issues? I am right now. Thank you. So you're going you're gonna to get all that money in the budget for us now that you've uh, heard this? Is that? <laughs> Just kidding. You don't have to answer that. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not actually kidding. <laughs> uh, in any event, so no, I really appreciate that, uh, Ms. McClure. That, that's very helpful to have those additional details. Great, thank you. Okay, else? Okay, welcome, um, Director uh, Davis. I'll give you a chance to to add testimony. Thank you. Yeah, thank you all. Buenas tardes. For the record, Susana Davis, Racial Equity Director for the state, and I am uh, grateful to. Um, the chief data officer for being able to walk us through some of those technical costs and staffing resources. I did just wanna add a little bit more to consider 
because while that is a great summary of the data and technological needs, for this division to be successful, there are also a couple of additional operational slash administrative things that should be considered here. Namely, uh, first administrative support. So I just wanted to, I, I find it helpful to remind folks sometimes that um, the agency of administration is actually a lot smaller than, than we tend to think it is. The AOA, for example, um, would under this bill support the council and the division but also that would be on top of its existing duties. So um, the administrative support for the agency also supports the secretary's office, the chief performance office, the racial equity office in its existing capacity, the office of risk management, the workers comp division, financial services, the uh, ICAR, the interagency council on rulemaking um, and a number of other pieces to that. So, would we, to, would we add this division that would create an additional um, burden for our central staff that's already spread a bit thin? And so I would just encourage us to consider um, that, that capacity and, and how we could support that. The other thing I wanted to mention is uh, legal assistance. I know that in order to execute and manage the data sharing agreements and other legal questions and agreements, and contracts and challenges, we're going to need robust legal support, um, particularly at the outset when we're setting all of this up. And I did just want to remind the room that the AOA also does not have a general counsel. A lot of other agencies around the state do, but we do not. We actually rely on the Attorney General's office for all of our legal assistance because we don't have a general counsel. So um, that's another thing just to keep in mind the necessity for that legal um, for that legal support, again, especially during the, the setup period. So those were the two items that I wanted to add on um, to what um, the chief data officer just said. So thank you. Go ahead, Martin. I can ask a question there. Uh, is that something that, that those, some of those administrative roles, uh, such as presumably setting up uh, the uh, advisory panel meetings, those kind of things. Is, is that something that would be encompassed by, by what we're calling the lead, uh, you know, the, the, using uh, Ms. McClure's uh, terminology? I mean, is that, or, or are we talking an additional half an FTE as an administrator, or how's that, how's that uh, pan out in the end? You know, potentially, if we consider a lead role, um, if we consider, a, well, so we want to understand the relationship between the lead, who may or may not be the person referred to as the deputy here. Um, so if we're thinking about the lead as being maybe not a 1.0 FTE or um, being able to spread duties a little bit thinner, then perhaps. But um, I would just say that you know, a big component of this is we want to make sure that we staff this in a way that people are being compensated fairly for all of the work that we're asking them to do and that we understand what we're asking them to do at the outset. So um, I think it would be good just to see a detailed breakdown of what we would be if we were to put those more administrative duties onto a lead. It would be helpful to see um, a, a more detailed breakdown about what exactly would be encompassed in that procedure altogether. And whether the administrative support, because some of that administrative support um, may support the division, but may not be exclusive to the division, right? So for example, um, I suppose I can think of, well, I can't on the spot, but someone could probably think of a situation where um, the administrative support might be needed um, for the Office of Racial Equity on the whole, and it might benefit or support the division, but maybe not be exclusive to it. Uh, if this is somebody who may need to liaise with AOA more broadly or with other departments and agencies, then um, just a clear definition of whether that person is specifically hired to support the division exclusively, or whether it's a little bit of a more fluid support role um, as needed, that would be, I'm so sorry, I don't even know if I've answered your question. Well, no, I, th I think there's still questions there. I guess I'm trying to understand what this bill would be asking 
of appropriations. And, and what I'm seeing right now is, uh, is um, that we probably can get away for a while with uh, three people, the lead, the analyst, the steward, and I'm using lead in lieu of deputy director. I'm, I'm considering that kind of the same role. Uh, but are we adding something in addition as far as some point, something of administrative support? Uh, that, that's really the question. Presumably, uh, Trevor, that's what we need to know. We would need to know that. I have a, a, just a follow-on question too, Susanna. Uh, how is your space in your office? I haven't been to your office in terms of accommodating additional folks. There is none. Okay. So we need to solve that problem too. Yeah. Cor correct, yes. And I mean, you know, if we're thinking with our 21st century brains, then conceivably, perhaps a number of these roles could be partly or fully remote. Um, these are tech-based roles, and so there's a possibility that maybe we could forego some office space. But again, I know that a lot of data do need to be housed on site somewhere. And so I don't necessarily want to volunteer staff not to have office space before they even get in the door. Um, but I would say that right now where we are located, um, there is not a comfortable, uh, I'll share that when we were um, hiring just or planning to hire the two racial equity staff, um, that were authorized last year, it was a bit of a challenge just figuring out where we could find space for the two workstations. So that would be another another consideration for us here. Thank you. Um, so, so I guess if we could, it's, I'm still not quite understanding how to uh, nail that last uh, issue down. Uh, presumably we can talk to the AG's office. You know, we can offline see if that this causes any resource issues with the AG's office, if they're gonna have to provide this additional assistance, uh, legal assistance. Uh, but how, how can we get to the point of understanding what additional resource we need for an administrator? Yeah, I mean, I really, I, I do think that it probably is appropriate to consider whether one of the existing roles might be able to be split. Um, if, if we determine, and I, I really would lean on the judgment of um, the chief data officer and the, CS, to the CRG representatives to let us know, can a lead be half time? At least at the beginning, you know, at the beginning of this project, if that's the case, then perhaps we could consider <clears throat> Um, having that person also serve in a in a semi in a part time administrative role, but um, you know again we just we want to make sure that the the support is there not just from a data infrastructure perspective but also just from the operational side. So maybe that is a good role uh, a good path to explore. Yeah. And, sorry. I don't. I don't want to shortchange this. I just want to, you know, really try to nail it down so that we're having only the staff that we need, uh, certainly. And I guess um, I, if Ms. McClure, if you have any, could weigh in on whether that's a possibility that somebody that's in the lead can do some of that work, for instance, with the advisory panel and the report reporting requirements. Yeah. To Susanna's point of potentially have the lead be like half head count and then um, other responsibilities in addition to that. I think that's totally appropriate. Um, and then much like we had talked about the DBA kind of ramping down over a few years when things are more in a steady state and established, I think that could also be appropriate for the lead too, if Susanna feels the same way. I appreciate that, thank you. Um, so I had a couple of, questions on the bill, and then I wanted to turn to the advisory panel and, and then certainly want to open it up, uh, Director Davis, if you have uh, any other particular uh, issues or questions with the latest draft. But just from the discussion right now, uh, I'm just looking, I don't know if you have the bill in front of you, but it's, I'm, I'm, I'm probably actually a draft behind, but it's the same page. Uh, I'm looking at uh, where we're talking about the duties of the executive director of racial equity <clears throat> in its uh, subsection E2, the director may in consultation with the racial justice statistics advisory board 
hire a deputy director to oversee the administration and operation of the division. Um, is that language necessary? Or is that the right language? If we're not necessarily, maybe this isn't the title shouldn't be deputy director. Uh, do you need that language in there to give the authority to, to hire whatever we were calling this position, the lead or not, or is that authority <clears throat> not necessary? Maybe this is a question as much for Representative Squirrel as well. Do we need to spell that out here or do we just spell it out when we're getting to the appropriation? Let me ask uh, Representative Squirrel that question first. Uh, I, I'm going to have to think on it a little bit. I, my initial reaction to that is probably doesn't need to be spelled out. I want to give as much discretion to the division to figure out precisely what the title is. And, and you know, we're getting the responsibilities at a higher level, and we want to leave the discretion as much as possible uh, with, with the division to make sure they're staffing it uh, the way they want to have it staffed. So I'm just suggesting that we, we delete that section. I don't know if there's a reason to keep that there, if you are troubled by that, uh, Director Davis, or not. No, I, I would agree. Um, while I'm not 100% certain whether the language would be required, I would agree that if we don't need it, then we could cut it. Okay. So the other thing I'd like to jump to talking a little bit about um, and, and like I said, I certainly would like any kind of additional feedback since you've had the bill for a little bit longer, uh, is with respect to, if I can find it, with respect to the, the advisory panel. And uh, I have a couple questions. I've, I've had pushback on, on how large that advisory <clears throat> panel is, not, not just necessarily in this committee, but elsewhere. Uh, there, there's some reluctance to have huge advisory panels. Um, and there was a rationale for it, but I have a couple things I wanna throw out there and get your comment on uh, if I could. Uh, one would be to essentially uh, eliminate all the members who are there as uh, in, in representing their, the entity that's providing data. So that would be the Supreme Court, you know, the Chief Justice <clears throat> designee, the Attorney General designee, Defender General, et cetera. And there's, that gets rid of probably 10 people. And instead have some form of language that would require each of those entities to have a designee available to the advisory panel uh, to, to provide it, you know, to provide information. So we can actually designate, rather than they have to be at every meeting, they can be called upon by the rest of the advisory panel. And the rest of the advisory panel, I, I would certainly get rid of the two members of the General Assembly. Uh, I don't think they need to be on there. Uh, but uh, there may be some questions on a couple of these people, uh, but certainly the six individuals that are representing the affected communities uh, being, I think, critical. Uh, somebody who deals with mental health treatment uh, somebody with expertise in community-based research on racial equity, maybe, maybe not uh, and somebody from Human Rights Commission, but in any event, have those affected entities providing advice with these other individuals available. So I wonder if you can comment on that concept, if that troubles you, or if that's one way to try to have perhaps a more manageable... The question... Uh, Martin? Oh, yes. Yeah. Uh, in our discussions, uh, one of the possibilities was to think in terms of a liaison, you know, from those respective entities. Because as the need changes over time, you might be assigning it. Let's say if I was the director of health, I might have one health officer be the liaison to direct certain data. And at other times, I might direct someone else. But having the liaison uh, relationship with that entity is the key factor, I think. Yeah, and I think that's exactly what I'm trying to get at. But you said it better than I did, uh, as always, Coach. So, uh, but yeah, that's, that's the concept. Uh, trying to make the, the panel um, 
easier to handle as far as the, the size. Um, any, any input on that? And I have a second idea to throw out there as well to chat about, but. I think that it would be appropriate. So I, I noticed that we have a trend of creating a new council board or commission for every new initiative that we pass. And I think that if we're judicious about how many we're creating and how large they are, then they can be useful and they can work with one another and it can be valuable. When we do those, one of the most important pieces of it is process equity. I care less about the number of people and more about who those people are and what constituencies they represent. So if we're considering reducing the number of members of the advisory council, then I would agree with you in wanting to protect the seats that are dedicated for community members, providers, people with lived experience, et cetera. So if we're thinking about reducing the size of the advisory council, and I actually do believe that we should reduce the size of the advisory council. So I think um, we're, we're really thinking along the same lines here. In terms of having uh, access to those seats, such as the General Assembly, the Chief Justice of the Court, Attorney General, Defender General, et cetera, um, I am confident that because of the vested interest that each of those entities has in the outcome and in the process here, that we wouldn't have a problem having a, um, a close working relationship with those offices, even if they don't have uh, roles on the council. So I'm feeling fine about that. The idea of a liaison is a good one. And I think it actually reminds me of another point that I wanted to make here, which was that, um, you know, in the bill, one of the things that I, um, that we had concerns about was an enforcement mechanism. What happens when reporting agencies are unwilling or unable to send their data? What kind of relationship do we have with those reporting agencies and what are their mechanisms in place to ensure that that happens? And so when we think about liaisons for the council and those reporting agencies, it makes sense to consider uh, whether and to what degree those intermediaries would uh, participate in any kind of enforcement mechanism should there need to be one. I hope I've said that clearly, but I think the summary of, of what I'm saying here is, sure, let's reduce the number. Yes, let's reduce it on the government side, not the community side. And uh, also, let's think about the relationship between those government entities and um, not just the role that they play on the council, but also what happens when we don't get the, the data required. Um, and I suppose the other thing that I would say about the advisory council is that we may, um, you know, we do want to make sure that we're not duplicating work. I noticed that one of the duties of the council is to report on uh, any disparities in criminal and juvenile justice and to report on the status of progress made and recommendations for further action to address systemic racial bias. Those two sound extremely similar to some of the reporting duties through the um, Racial Equity Director and Racial Equity Advisory Panel. So if there's an opportunity for collaboration on those, then maybe, maybe there's a, a, a good opportunity for joint reporting. But um, otherwise, I don't want to saddle you all as legislators with having to read three reports on the same topic. So those are, those are my comments on the advisory panel. Oh, so, and that's uh, page 10, I believe, subsection four. Um, a and B, I think that you were just referring mm -hmm. to yeah. as far as yeah. uh, status reporting. So the idea is perhaps to fold that in with the reporting requirements that, that your office already has. Well, well, see, Possibly, I'm excuse me, I'm sorry. No, I apologize, Representative. Please go ahead. Uh, being that the Office of Racial Equities mandate by statute is those reports already it would seem to me that in agreement uh with director davis that if uh attorney fitzpatrick uh can give us a little guidance around language as to how we can wrap those reports together because they are in the same space, 
and they will be directed under or within that office, it would seem only, you know, you know, <laughs> uh, judicious to go ahead and have those two reports linked together, because otherwise it's it's just another piece of paper. Um, I would hope that by having the two entities work together on that report, we're going to get more robust information as to where things actually are at any given point in time. So anyways. Thank you, Representative. And actually, I know that I'm the one who raised the point, but I'd also, I think it's fair for me to use the counter argument, which is, uh, I know that there's a strong, a strong desire for this work to be as um, honest and independent as possible. And so it, it's very possible that we want these to be separate reports. If it's folded into the racial equity office, which is under the executive, then, you know, I understand that there were concerns about whether, how, to what degree this work is housed in the office. And so if the legislature so chooses, we could leave those reports separate as a way to ensure that there are different workflows reporting on this so that it's not, um, you know, too consolidated. So I, I, I did want to raise that. I think that that would um, you'd be fine, but just wanted to point it out at least. Appreciate that. Um, so I guess the, the other option, and, and um, if you could comment on whether this is workable and, and maybe the independence issue already is, is a problematic, but there is a racial equity advisory panel. And what would be the pros and cons expanding the membership of that current panel and expanding their duties as opposed to having this uh, as a separate advisory panel? Mm, okay. So that is a fascinating question and it's one that the panel and I have also considered. I think that um, the enabling statute that established the racial equity advisory panel and the executive director of racial equity role did a great job of um, stating what were the goals of our work, but I don't think that it did a clear job of explaining the panel's concrete duties. And so I believe that the panel would welcome a revision slash expansion of its charge, provided that that was accompanied by a commensurate um, bump in support. And I say that because the support person for the advisory panel is again in the agency of administration, specifically the Department of Human Resources. And um, that staff person also wears very many hats as it is. So the short answer is yes, we could do that. Um, but then let's look again at um, we are in 3 VSA chapter 68, 5002 and 5003. Maybe we take another look at those um, kind of good fit. So if, if I may, um, uh, Representative Squirrel, in looking at consolidating and utilizing um, staff most expeditiously uh, and effectively, what I'm hearing is there will be a need for administrative support within this division. There's also built in already administrative support that is being offered by the administration itself just because they need the support. And the question becomes effectiveness, but also with the growth of the office, it may be that we might look at assigning an administrator that has the functionality to be that entity that supports the advisory panel and also supports the office and division as well. And I think that we might be able to get um, 
you know, the most or the best value, you know, for, you know, that dollar, you know, spent and also answer those, uh, those needs that were bought up. And then also to look at this expansion piece, something that comes to my mind are the people who've been involved in this process, especially the community members that are specialists in the area of data, they're the same people. And, and so if I was recruiting someone to join the other panel, it would be one of the members from the racial equity panel already, because he's probably one of the most uh, talented data people in, in that field. So we're already gonna be knocking on his door. So what I'm saying is Director Davis's idea about expanding the advisory panel and possibly having a subcommittee in the panel as we redesign the charge that has the responsibility for the data, being that the statute already enables the work to be done because the enabling statute has the responsibility of that office is a major data collection piece as well. So does, does I hope that helps a little bit, Representative Score. No, I, I think the thought process is, uh, is going in the right direction. Uh, we've already talked about some of the administrative duties potentially being part of the lead. Uh, I, I think we have to have more conversation about this. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think from an, from an appropriation standpoint that this is uh, a big issue. Okay. Thank you. So again, it, it comes back to uh, Representative Lalonde and uh, Director Davis, uh, a policy perspective around design. And, and that's where we go to the, the magic man, uh, Attorney Fitzpatrick, you know. <laughs> oh, so I guess an, uh, a question I would have is what, um... If you could comment, uh, Director Davis, that is there would there be an issue related to the independence if we pull this into the racial equity advisory panel? Because just to reiterate, that's one of the primary purposes of the advisory panel that has a strong presence of uh, members of communities uh, on that panel. Uh, I suppose we could modify the equity advisory panel adding some more members but I, i'm not sure I, so if you just comment on what whether you think we can re maintain the independence critical to the structure if we were to use the racial equity advisory panel that exists now and just expand its scope membership and support yeah i mean you know um Independence and objectivity, of course, are two different things. I um, am confident that whatever work is assigned to the racial equity director slash office of racial equity will be conducted objectively. But in terms of the perception of independence from the community, it likely would be received negatively if we did hold these, uh, this council's duties into the racial equity advisory panel because the advisory panel is um, advisory to the governor. So. That public perception is, is likely to be what it is, but um, yeah. Okay, no, that's that's very helpful. Thank you. Yep. Yep. Um, Thank you. So those are the main issues that, that I had. But were there any other um, any other suggestions of what we should look at with the uh, with the bill? Um, either Director Davis or, or uh, Ms. McClure, any other issues that you could raise or are, we, or are we getting close with the rest of the language? 
No, I have no further comments on the latest version. Thank you. And how about you, Director Davis? Are you anything else? Not for now, I don't think so. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Great. So I was, was hoping that we could hear from uh, from Karen and, and and Dr. Crocker just that you know if we could just get a sense from them because they dealt with this kind of data. They feel that we're on the right track. If they have any input on where we're going, uh, that, that would be helpful. And also, you know, we haven't gone into this that much, and maybe we back up to Director Davis for a moment. If 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 you can, <clears throat> we, we've gotten really technical. I would like to, before we get to, to Karen, go back up at a higher level. And if you could explain to us again the importance of what we're trying to accomplish here. I, I know that that came out. Uh, previous testimony, but that would be very helpful for us to kind of reset kind of why are we doing this? Absolutely. So, you know, it's 2020 is certainly not the beginning of racial equity work in this country or state by any means, but it was really pivotal, I think, in a lot of ways for state government and local government and for communities and corporations and everyone under the sun. It really marked a time where we started seeing more conversation and more gestures and had to be much more discerning about which of them were performative and which of them were good faith, sincere efforts to move the needle on equity. And I cannot help myself but to remind everybody all the time that equity benefits everybody always. And so if we have work that we say is valuable and needs to be done and important, that is only true unless we meaningfully and tangibly invest in that work. We can't say we love our youth without investing in youth. We can't say we wanna fix housing unless we invest in housing. Similarly, we can't say that we really wanna move the needle on equity and not just in criminal justice, but in any other sector without really being able to do what it takes and pay what it costs. So, if we were to create this um, work flow, and if we do it right, then what we're gonna do is have more eyes and more focus on disparities in justice. And we know that criminal justice is both an upstream and a downstream factor. There are a lot of things that happen in a person's life before getting involved in the justice system. And that person's involvement in the justice system leads to cascading other consequences. So once we have better focus and more attention and more resources to support these analyses, then we're going to be able to make smarter, better, and more economical policy decisions as a result. What it also does is signals to all of the law enforcement agencies around the state and to the state as a whole that this is a priority. It's something that we care about. It's not just a two-page policy or a resolution or a declaration that we signed once and never revisited. It's an active and ongoing effort to monitor what we already know to be unjust so that we can get to the point where it stops being unjust by default. If I can continue to predict people's outcomes based on their skin color, we're not there yet. And if we want to keep being upset and disappointed in ourselves by not getting there yet, then let's just do what we've been doing. Um, but if we wanna to get to the point where we are leaders locally and nationally, which we often are as a state, then it, it seems to me that the path forward is uh, do more, look closely, and again, tangibly invest in the things that we say are important. I am gonna stop there because I could, do this for hours. I, I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Um, I wonder if I can ask Karen a question off off the bat. So, so actually, why don't we let Karen um, in, introduce herself for the record, oh, please? Welcome. Good afternoon. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for having me. I'm Karen Gannett, the executive director of Crime Research Group. Great. So, uh, Ms. Gannett, uh, so. I know that you've been dealing with criminal justice data in Vermont for years, and you've certainly provided us 
in the Judiciary Committee with a lot of uh, very important data. We're actually, we're looking at some of your output uh, just yesterday with respect to uh, uh, different offenses. But given, given that history, given the work you've done, why, why do we need to be doing this initiative? What, what's the benefit from your perspective? Well, I can't say that I can say it any better than Susanna just said it. Um, she's way more articulate than I am on the issue. But I will say, um, I can add that um, one of the documents that we've been looking at in, our, in the RDAP meetings, and we've been um, very active in the RDAP meetings, um, we did the summer meetings weekly from six to eight on Monday nights, which was um, everyone groaned, but we all were there and we you know, got to work and we did a lot of work on and getting that report out to you all. Um, and we used the Actionable Intelligence for Social Policy Toolkit for centering racial equity throughout data integration. And I think it's ASIP, A-I-S-P. Um, it's a toolkit um, from the University of Pennsylvania, and they did they did a phenomenal job of putting together a toolkit that really talks about exactly that, centering racial equity throughout data integration, which is exactly what we're doing here. And one of the things that they said that I that I think really captures what's what what's behind this bill and what RDAP was trying to do, striving to do. And they said, and I'm gonna I'm gonna quote something from that toolkit. At this moment in history, we can co-create data infrastructure to promote racial equity and the public good, or we can invest in data infrastructure that disregards the historical, social, and political context, reinforcing racial inequity that continues to harm communities. Building data infrastructure without a racial equity lens and understanding of historical context will exacerbate existing inequalities along the lines of race, gender, class, and ability. Instead, we commit to contextualize our work in the historical and structural oppression that shapes it and organize stakeholders across geography, sector, and experience to center racial equity throughout data integration. And I think that's exactly what this bill and what RDAP has been attempting to do, and I do think it's a historical moment in Vermont's history. I think the setup of the Office of Racial Equity was historic, and I think this is historic. And I think that, um, I think one of the last things I was, I was gonna end with this, but I'll start with it, is that so many projects and initiatives are stood up without the appropriate funding to make them successful. And, and, and I understand you all want this to be successful, but so many times we're trying to chip away at what's in the budget that people present. Um, and the leaders of those projects and initiatives, and I could, I could name some, um, scramble from day one to make it work without the necessary funding. And we watch this happen. And then we wonder why we're not getting the outcomes that we were hoping to achieve and the answer is always, well, it wasn't funded appropriately. So I would encourage you to really consider in your deliberations to fund this as best you can to the highest extent you can possible to make sure ADS and the new division are successful. Um, one of the, and, and I so totally understand the budget implications, but one of the things that, um, I think is really important to understand is the, um, the foundational work that has to happen before any data analysis happens. And this is where I think the, the lead person, whatever their responsibilities is incredibly important to helping put together that foundational work. Um, we're doing some of it be in the background, um, trying to get things set up for ADS and the division going forward and we're hoping to hand that work off to them as, as soon as um, the bill passes and they're set up. Um, but one of the things we I know you've heard from Tanya Marshall not too long ago in this committee, the, the archivist and data records, the director for, um, I actually don't even know her, her formal title, but she was, she did a phenomenal job in your committee and she's been working with us and she's, she's actually working with us on looking at people, systems, and data, 
and having people that are responsible in the departments that have to get the data to ADS and the division and having someone responsible and have the authority for getting the data over to ADS and the new division, um, making sure the systems have what they need. When, when um, <clears throat> Director Davis mentions, you know, what's the, what's the um, consequence for, for departments not sharing data, um, some of what we found in our work is that sometimes departments don't have the data to share or they can't extract it from their systems. They don't know what to do. They don't know how to get it out of their systems. So we have to work with them over time to actually make that happen. And so making sure the systems are built up and enhanced enough to make that possible is a really important piece to this. And then the other piece she talks about is the data themselves and making sure that the data has um, is reliable and is credible and what needs to be done to make sure that happens in not only each one of the departments, but sometimes the departments have more than one data system. So it has to happen for each data system. So this is some of the foundational work that has to happen up front. And I think it's really important to recognize this. It's not the, it's not the fun part of data analysis, getting data and doing data analysis, um, but it's, it's really the, the foundational grunt work that has to happen. And that includes getting the data sharing agreements and the MOUs and making sure someone is there that can help make that happen right off the bat is, is a really criti critically important function. And I think I went way beyond answering your question, Representative Lalonde. No, you answered my three other questions that I was going to follow up with. <laughs> so that, that's handy. Um, so do, do you feel, I mean, uh, it would be the lead, the analyst and the steward as we defined it, that would be doing this foundational work? Or is that, is that your understanding that that's kind of the, the appropriate uh, setup? Uh, I mean, we could presumably do more if we had more of them, but but those are the positions that would do this kind of work. Um, yes, and I think and and Kristen can correct me if I, I'm wrong, but I think the project manager at ADS is is critical to this as well. Okay, thank you. And I also want to mention that, you know, as we've been talking about data, it's not just new data that we're looking at here, but there are also existing data sets and there's existing data that can be accessed. So having, having the analyst on board to help identify data and existing data sets and learning about Vermont data is also a really important piece. It's not like someone can be hired and come on and immediately start analyzing data. There are a lot of nuances to the criminal justice system and the criminal justice data. And so there is a period of learning that's gonna to have to happen for that data analyst and the data steward. I'm good. Thank you. Thank you, and I'm not seeing, um, Coach, I'm not sure if you have a question or if that's your hand from before. Thank you, Karen. Any, anything else before we Thanks, Karen. On? That was a leg legacy hand, Madam Chair. Okay. Great, thank you. Okay. Um, Professor Crocker, if you would like to add to the conversation. Good afternoon, welcome. Hi, I'm Abby Crocker. I'm a professor of statistics at the University of Vermont. Um, and I'll just sort of echo my, my support um, for this bill as al and also like thank you for doing all the work to get it to this point and being so intentional about it. <coughs> Echoing what some others have said about the the potential that this sort of division has for being sort of a game changer for the state um, is you know is something that you know I, I can't emphasize enough. Um, it's not only centering racial equity in data integration, which you know the the platform that is 
developed right now, I actually think is a great way to sort of scaffold and add to it sort of across domains, you know, start with criminal justice, but there's no reason not to add education or health or whatever down the road. Um, by starting small, you're ensuring that you're setting up the system well for expansion. Um, uh, the positions you've described sound great to me. I really appreciated, um, Kristen, you're walking through a lot of the, the process and the details of the balance between the division and ADS for how it will physically work. Um, and appreciated the attention to the data use agreements. I might echo that the lead person, um, I would hope that that person would also, you know, mentioning focusing on the legal issues around ensuring the right data use agreements to build the data set, but at the same time, another complementary data use agreement about how to share it with external researchers like myself and all of the faculty at the University of Vermont and graduate students and such. Um, I think having a centralized data resource um, that's connected so well and grounded in the Office of Racial Equity and has this advisory group function means, you know, it's sort of like a, a one place to go to for um, to partner to to do sort of state level or policy level kinds of analyses and answer research questions that are, you know, in, of interest to the state. And so when we talk about investing in these, you know, this handful of positions as a way to actually invest resources to increase analytic capacity, I would also add that I actually think by investing in these few positions, you increase the analytic capacity of the state, you know, exponentially because it creates a pathway for folks like myself um, to partner with the state uh, to do this kind of work, which, which has been more challenging um, for everybody in the past. And it's just something that hasn't existed, which is, I think one of the reasons we're here today is, is we don't have enough analytic capacity. We don't have enough of the, the centralized resources to answer the questions that we know are really important to inform the work. So um, I, I think this, 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 division um, supports that. And I would just say, as you're thinking about ramping it up, the, the thing that jumps out to me is this importance of the foundational work and that mention of, well, once we get the data system set up well, then it's sort of just running. And the intention would be to set it up well as early as possible, meaning um, also when you're thinking about what data to collect from the different <laughs> systems, um, be thinking sort of broadly so that you don't have to go back to the same data set and say, oh, we should have gotten that while we were in there. We should have gotten that while we were in there. And so thinking about meeting the needs, not only of like the specific dashboarding requirements, but also the future research questions and the future potential of those different data sets. So, so that when we do find ourselves X number of years down the road saying, oh, let's let's work together to do this analysis to answer this question. We're not saying, oh, we'd have to go back and go back to that original data set and rebuild it. So I think that foundational work um, in building a, as much of a comprehensive data set as possible from the beginning, recognizing that we'd add entities, you know, sort of one at a time um, would be great, as well as the intentionality of establishing some of those data use agreements um, not only to build the data set, but also to leverage more of the analytic capacity across the state would be things to consider. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. This is for me very, very helpful. It really, oh, go ahead, um, Trevor. Yeah, I, I have a question for Kristen. Uh, am I correct in thinking that when you talked about the database administrator and the project manager for ADS, that these they're going to be contractors? These are people you're going to bring on board or people you've worked with before? Correct. Yes, they will be okay. contractors. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then, uh, given your experience probably in the workplace, knowing all the workforce challenges we've had across every department, every group, uh, do you foresee any real challenges in hiring the kinds of people we're talking about to do the work? Well, short answer, yes. Um, 
getting strong qualified candidates is really challenging, especially in the technology space. Um, so yes, that's, I'd say an ongoing challenge. Okay. I, I, I expected that answer. <laughs> uh, I, I don't have any other questions at this time, but uh, uh, committee, thanks for inviting me. This has been very helpful for me to uh, do a deeper dive into this, this bill and, and the expectations of the bill. Thank you. Thank you. Repres Thank Representative you. Squirrel, thank you so much for coming. We appreciate it. Absolutely. <coughs> okay. Great. Great. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. And yes, please. We will return.